Well, hello everyone who is here with us. Welcome. I'm Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Marketing at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, and I am also a pickle enthusiast, so both professionally and personally, very glad to be here with all of you as we celebrate National Pickle Month along with our wonderful event partner, the Workers' Circle. Um, just a little bit about them. The Workers' Circle is a nonprofit organization that powers progressive Jewish identity through Jewish cultural engagement, Yiddish language learning, multi-generational edu multi education, and social justice activism and, communi and community building rooted in Yiddishkeit and heritage. You can check them out at www.circle.org. Here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, our mission is to educate and learn from our diverse community in New York City and far beyond, uh, as all of you are testament to, about Jewish heritage and life before, during, and after the Holocaust, which includes thousands of years of pickles. Um, our public programs at the museum support this mission by illuminating Jewish culture and storytelling, historic and current anti-Semitism, first person accounts of survival and resistance, and much more, uh, which you can see all at mjhnyc.org, where you can also become a member of the museum or make a donation to help sustain our work and our public events. Um, we are especially excited just to plug an upcoming series of events uh, to be hosting Summer Thursdays. It's starting next week. Uh, it's five Thursdays of literature, music, dinner, and drinks on the museum's second floor, which overlooks New York Harbor. It's very beautiful. Uh, if you're nearby, I really hope you'll join us. Um, great. Okay, so before we dive into the brine, um, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't help myself. I wrote so many puns when I was writing this introduction and I'm saving you really for most of them. So that, that's, the, that's the last one. Uh, just, just a little bit of Zoom protocol. Um, I will be off camera during the talk, but I'll be here in the chat if you need anything, any technical issues or anything like that. Um, and if you have questions for our wonderful speakers, please do use the Q&A function below. It just helps us to keep track of everything. Um, and we'll get to as many of your questions as we can following the conversation and the demo. Whew. Okay, so now is the real pleasure part, which is to introduce you to our speakers. Sander Katz is the author of five books. Wild Fermentation, The Art of Fermentation, The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved. I love that. Fermentation as Metaphor, and his latest Fermentation Journeys. Katz's books, along with the hundreds of fermentation workshops he has taught around the world, have helped to catalyze a broad revival of the fermentation arts. A self-taught experimentalist who lives in rural Tennessee, Katz is the recipient of a James Beard Award and many other honors. Ann Toback is the CEO of the Workers' Circle. The first woman to be CEO of the organization, Toback has served in her position for more than 14 years, establishing the Workers' Circle as a social justice organization that finds inspiration and power in Yiddish language and Eastern European activ activist tradition of resistance, resilience, and cultural engagement. Anne and the Workers' Circle work fiercely on the front lines in the struggle to build multiracial, multicultural democracy that both works and is accountable to every one of us. Thank you both so much for being here and for your work. Um, appreciate it so much. Take us away. Thank you. And thank you, Ariel. I love the Museum of Jewish Heritage and um, also a great place to um, visit and, and have a nosh in their amazing cafe. Sander, um, this is like a dream come true. Your book has been inspiring me in my pickle journey for, for years and years. So um, let's get started. We have a really interesting audience. I'm seeing some of the incredible comments already. Um, but, but the first question is, um, why fermentation? And can you give us um, a description of your own pickling origin story? 
Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I grew up in New York City on, on the Upper West Side, I mean, a block and a half from Zabar's. And, um, you know, I loved pickles as a kid. And, um, you know, I wasn't thinking a lot about how they were made, but I did notice that, you know, some, at some of my friends' houses, I would have pickles that had a very different flavor uh, than the pickles that I was used to. And later I came to understand that the pickles that I grew up with, the Eastern European style sour and half sour pickles, um, uh, don't have any vinegar added and that the sourness is the result of fermenting the pickles under a saltwater brine solution. And, you know, the other kinds of pickles, which I, you know, I also have always liked. I don't think I've ever met a pickle I didn't like. Um, um, but that, that those are made with vinegar and vinegar is acetic acid and the acid that results from the fermentation is lactic acid and they have very different flavors, although they both can be very effective at, at preserving food. And I think because there are these sort of two different ways of making pickles, and I mean, really, there's way more than two ways of making pickles, but, you know, there's two uh, major ways that, um, uh, you know, you'll find around the United States. Um, um, and uh, there's a lot of confusion about, uh, uh, you know, pickles and fermentation. And, you know, the way I like to explain it to people is that pickling and fermentation are, are, are overlapping concepts. We could make a, a Venn diagram and there's a place where, 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 where they meet. And that would be like, you know, this jar of pickles uh, 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 right here, or for that matter, this jar of sauerkraut or a jar of kimchi, you know, any kind of like sour fermented vegetables, you know, that's a kind of a pickle. Um, and those are made by fermentation. But of course, there's many other fermented foods that are not a pickle at all. A, a loaf of bread is not a pickle. A bottle of wine is not a pickle. Um, um, so it's only the fermented foods where you're preserving something in an acidic uh, uh, ingredient that would be a pickle. And then of course, you know, you can pour a hot vinegar solution over, over anything, over, um, uh, you know, cucumbers or onions, or, you know, for that matter, hard boiled eggs or pig's feet. I mean, you know, people pickle all kinds of things under a vinegar solution. And of course the vinegar is a product of fermentation, but the process of making the pickle typically does not involve fermentation. Although there are hybrid methods where people add a small proportion of vinegar to a brine in which they want the, 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 the pickles to, to ferment. And um, talking about fermentation and, and particular the, the, salt, uh, the salt method or what we call that kosher. Can you connect kosher dills uh, to fermentation? Is that what distinguishes what we now call kosher? Yeah, sure. I mean, that I mean, the, the same thing that I just called sour pickles or half sour pickles like those are widely known. I mean, when I was in New York, I never heard them called kosher dills. I just heard them called sour pickles. But when I left New York, I, I learned that like the code word for that kind of a pickle is a kosher dill pickle. Um, uh, um, you know, but, but, you know, I mean, from uh, having had the opportunity to teach in contemporary Eastern Europe, I mean, I've learned that, um, um, you know, you, you, you don't let, like, like the old Levy's, uh, 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 rye bread ad, you're like, you don't have to be Jewish to love uh, a sour pickle. Um, um, you know, it's, 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 it's broadly enjoyed, um, you know, by, by people around Eastern Europe, um, um, you know, regardless of whether or not they're, um, um, uh, of, of Jewish descent. Sure. And, and there's health benefits to what we're now calling, um, sour half sour kosher dills yeah sure so i mean that's that that's a huge um, you know comparing the two different styles of, of of pickles i mean one of the reasons why vinegar pickles have become so prominent on supermarket shelves is that once you pour a hot vinegar solution over the vegetables and heat process that it can just sit without refrigeration on a shelf indefinitely mm -hmm. um whereas the um uh, uh the, the sour pickles the brined pickles the fermented pickles they're much more dynamic 
Um, and, um, you know, if you want to store them for any length of time, you need to store them, you know, either in an earth temperature cellar or in a refrigerator. And if you leave them at room temperature, I mean, they won't become dangerous. The acidity will really protect them from any kind of like pathogenic organisms. However, um, you know, the biggest challenge with, with cucumber pickles is keeping them crispy. And there are enzymes that will, that will break down the pectins, which are the, which are what make them crispy and crunchy. Um, and so they can get soft and mushy. And, and if you keep them at ambient temperature for any length of time, those enzymes will activate and make the pickles get soft and mushy. So, you know, they're much more dynamic and, and realistically, they need to be refrigerated if you want to, you know, store them for, for any length of time. Right, right. And, um, that and, and, and in terms of health benefits, you know, one of the reasons they're so dynamic is that, you know, they're teeming with, um, um, you know, all of these lactic acid bacteria. And, you know, lactic acid bacteria are very beneficial to us. We all have lactic acid bacteria uh, um, um, in our gut, but, you know, eating uh, um, live sour pickles, eating sauerkraut, eating kimchi, eating yogurt, you know, like so many different kinds of, you know, fermented foods, if they haven't been cooked or heat processed, you know, it's a way of replenish, replenishing and diversifying bacteria in the gut, which can have all kind of, kinds of benefits for us in terms of digestion, in terms of immune function, and, and really beyond that. I mean, there's this whole new um, um, uh, uh, area of research looking at, you know, mental health and how, you know, bacteria-rich foods, you know, can actually enhance mental health because bacteria in our gut play such an important role in regulating chemicals such as serotonin that have so much impact uh, on how we think and how we feel. That, that's incredible. And it's also, um, it, it's sort of a counter to this movement that I'm seeing in the United States to spend a fortune on um, probiotics and other things when you really can get them in easily fermented foods and maybe even more benefits than um, packaged packaged yeah. probiotics or you know depending I'm not and there, there there actually was some some recent research suggesting that you know taking um, um, you, know, you know probiotics that are billions of copies of a single cell you know might actually hinder biodiversity mm -hmm. in the gut rather than helping to build it and 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 pickles actually are just a positive and that that fermentation the, is it the lactobacillic fermentation is, is, is a very positive piece, uh, a positive um, thing to eat for your gut. So it, it's, it's got a lot of benefits. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in a, in a, 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 um, there's a lot of um, lore about pickle brine as uh, as a as a miracle cure. Um, so, you know, when you when you finish that jar of pickles, like don't pour the brine down the drain. You know, you can sip it, you can incorporate it into salad dressings, into soups, um, um, uh, into sauces. I mean, I mean, it has really many uh, uh, applications. It's also a very popular drink or semi-popular drink with vodka. It's in place of uh, martini, well, like a martini. That's yeah, yeah. a lot of fun. Um, yeah, pickle brine, especially the homemade variety is, is absolutely delicious. Um, and I just want to let people know I'm seeing incredible comments. Um, just to give you our schedule, we're going to be talking. Um, Sander is going to be demoing pickling, and then we're going to get to some of your comments and questions. And they're all incredible. People are sharing their pickling stories on the chat, even as we speak. Um, you referenced Eastern Europe and the Ashkenazic Jewish tradition, Sander. And um, just to share, that's that's the that's the part of pickling that brought me into pickling about um, 15, 14, 15 years ago when I learned how to ferment in, in the jar. And, and Sandra was showing you um, the jar. When, when you're actually, when you're fermenting your own jar of pickles, you're really copying a process that um, the Eastern European Jewish uh, community brought here in the early 1900s. And, it's one way we can tangibly connect to that heritage. 
Um, you went there, Sandra. Do you want to talk a little bit about that pickling tradition that that was brought here? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, there there are many, many, many different kinds of pickles in the world, and and you know, in a in in a lot of different cultures and culinary traditions. You know, people, you know, enjoy pickles as, you know, an accent to the meal, as a condiment, uh, um, as a culinary enhancement. And I, you know, I just happened to sort of like grab a, a few of my um, um, books about pickling. But, you know, this is an amazing book, Usha's Pickle Digest, that's about Indian pickles and you know Indian pickling is a vast vast realm. Um, a couple of books about um, a, a Russian cuisine, but in 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 um, uh, a Russian cuisine, there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, pickling that people do. Korean cuisine. I mean, you know, we might think of kimchi as being one thing, but there's you know there's 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 infinite variation on how people make kimchi. Japanese cuisine has some of the most um, uh, 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 varied pickles. Chinese cuisine has has tons of pickling. Um, uh, you know, I know that Persian cuisine, um, uh, you know, Lebanese and other Middle Eastern cuisines. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of pickles in the world. But you know, because you know, my grandparents all came from uh, 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 Russia and, and Belarus and, and Poland and Lithuania. Um, you know, it's the Eastern European ones that I grew up with and, and that, you know, really have become part of the culture of New York in particular. Um, and so, you know, that's, that, that, that's the flavor that I craved. And when I started playing around with fermentation, you know, that was, you know, something that, that was a high priority for me to learn uh, uh, how to make. Yeah, um, it, it, it's something that really connects so many um, people, uh, Eastern European and otherwise. I just wanted to share, I, I've had the privilege of knowing um, many people who are survivors of the Holocaust who came here um, after the war, and even some people who came before the war who, who were born in Eastern Europe, and they all talk about um, having barrels in their homes, especially if they lived in the countryside, and one barrel would be filled with cucumber pickles and one would be filled with sauerkraut. And that was something that, that, that was a story that I've heard multiple times and a real um, sense of joy when the people talked about it. And I'm always interested in what that must have been like being in a rather small house with a barrel of fermenting um, sauerkraut and cucumbers in the middle of winter, for example. And um, I wanna encourage everyone, when you make your own pickles to think about that, because one jar has such a powerful scent, odor, if you will, the idea of being around a barrel. Now, have you tried that, Sander? Have you tried these major, you know, a major? Amount? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I've, I've, I mean, not so much with cucumber pickles, but with sauerkraut. I mean, I, I, I literally got a 55 gallon oak barrel that had been used by the Jack Daniels Distillery, which is just about 30 miles from where I live, and. Um, you know, I filled it up with shredded cabbage and and made beautiful sauerkraut in it in in in, in my cellar. And um, uh, you know, now I have I have other vessels that are that are that big, and um, I make big batches sometimes. And um, you know, and 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 it works out great. And you know, the thing is with a big with a big batch, and I, I mean, just with my life of um of, of, you know fermenting a lot and teaching about fermentation, I feel like I live my life in a cloud of um um you know uh, uh, um sauerkraut aroma <laughs> and some people are very put off by it i mean i would say i get emails every couple of months from people who are like oh my god i love to make sauerkraut but my my partner hates the smell of it you know what can i do can you help me save my relationship and um uh, you know the funniest solution i ever i ever heard was somebody who sort of ran a little um a, um a, a, a tube out of their fermentation vessel and out into out the window so that the you know, so 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 that the 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 byproducts, the sulfur compounds. I mean, that's really what people find objectionable: sulfur compounds. But so that they would go out the window instead of into the apartment. Wow. 
<laughs> I understand the love of pickles, but that really is going a, an enormous <laughs> distance. And someone on the chat did remind me it's aroma, not scent, not smell. I'll take aroma. And you, you caught that. Um, we, we talk about Ashkenazic. Do you have any other um, Jewish traditions? We were speaking before about Sephardim or Mizrahi. Um, I know there's Persian pickling, and of course there was a, a, a vast Jewish community in Persia. Um, what other Jewish traditions have you come across with pickling? Um, I mean, really not, not, not a lot. Um, um, uh, other than the Ashkenazi traditions. I mean, you know, I, I imagine that they exist in other places. Um, um, yeah, you know, so like to take for example, like, you know, P Persian pickling, you know, there's a, there's a word, torshi, that they use in, in Persian pickles, but it's, it's, it's you, I've seen that, that word used in describing pickles from like Bulgaria, Romania, um, um, you know, all the way to um, um, Persia. So, you know, that's that that that's a word associated with pickling, and sometimes that just that describes something that's brined and fermented, and sometimes that's used to describe something that's that's made with vinegar. And in fact, in a lot of traditions, um, you know, that that historically were primarily traditions of brining, with the increased availability of cheap vinegar and the sort of advantage in terms of longer term stability of vinegar pickles, um, um, you know, some of them have been um, uh, uh, largely replaced. Um, but, uh, mm. but, you know, I mean, to me, it's about the it's about the flavor, you know, and, 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 you know, the flavor of a brined pickle is just very distinctive and very special. And because I grew up around it, it's just like, that's the pickle that I crave. So, those are the pickles that I generally make. I mean, if I have a huge glut of cucumbers, I mean, you know, I'll make bread and butter pickles or 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 other kinds of pickles that I can heat process and and you know can sit in the pantry for months or years. But um, you know, more often I'm I'm fermenting pickles. And, and when when you say pickles, do you have a favorite vegetable to pickle outside of let's say cucumbers? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, this is all like, you know, th so this is this is a daikon sauerkraut. I mean, this is this this I make a uh, yeah, you know, th this I'm making like 50 gallons a year of and and you know, giving it to my neighbors and friends, eating it every day. Um, you know, I love this, but you know, it's because this is very stable and 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 um and and you know, I made this last November. Um, this has only been in the refrigerator for the last week or so. It was in wow. my cellar the, the 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 whole time. Cucumbers are the most challenging vegetable to pickle because um, uh, you know they will just get softer and mushier faster than any other vegetable. So you know the daikons, if I left them long enough in a warm environment, they too would become soft and mushy. But it would take a lot longer than 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 cucumbers will. And when we get to the demo, you know, really mostly that's going to consist of you know tips to try to keep your cucumber pickles crunchy because that's the challenge. Yeah, we're getting questions. We we've already had a couple of questions about how to keep your cucumbers crunchy, why do they get soft? And somebody just asked, um, why do sometimes they get hollow in the center? But before we do that, I do wanna point out some really great comments in the chat and we'll, we'll be answering more questions after. Um, uh, Yaffa Goldschmidt talks about the Sephardi pickle uh, watermelon and beetroot, which, is, which sounds fantastic. And then someone else was saying that their Sephardic grandmother uh, uh, made garlic dill brine pickles. So I guess that this style of pickles is not necessarily exclusive to, you know, Eastern European lineages. Yeah, and and someone talked about turnips here. Um, so we're yeah we're getting all sorts of interesting comments. This is it's really incredible. There's um, hundreds of people on this webinar right now, and we're getting many many comments and stories pickling is just such an incredible uh, tradition literally you can pickle anything i mean i have a friend who um who is a, a who is a, a cherokee and uh in his cherokee tradition people pickle ears of corn whole ears, ears of corn Interesting. um oh, and that's delicious that. uh, uh, uh pickled corn but you know anything you have a lot of you could potentially pickle 
that that's I it 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 makes me just want to you know go crazy and I guess that's the beauty of this we really can even in small New York apartments um, right. oh and I see someone just mentioned tomatoes and you know yes green tomatoes are another you know classic one you know you know my grandfather would let me eat all of the cucumber pickles but he was into the pickled green tomatoes which is as a, as a kid was a little bit too sour and too scary for me <laughs> so people why don't we move into the um the demo and then because there's so many comments and questions um oh and i do want to also comment a couple of people brought up pickled fish so we do have a tradition of pickled lox, um, pickled herring. Um, I guess that is, is that primarily an Eastern European tradition too? Well, I mean, also Nordic. I, I, I yes, mean, you know, like, you know, Norway, Sweden, like, you know, there's a lot of um, um, uh, 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 pickled fish uh, uh, available. Um, you know, mostly that's, uh, that's in a vinegar brine, but, you know, there's this, uh, you know, somewhat notorious Swedish pickled herring called surströmming, which is a low salt fermented uh, a, a herring, which is, you know, really delicious, but has a very specific flavor that, um, you know, not everybody loves. Um, uh, um, so, so yeah, I mean, you certainly you can pickle things beyond vegetables, fruits. There's a particularly in Russian cuisine. There's a lot of pickling of uh, of, of fruits. Um, in um, uh, Indian pickling, a lot of pickling of green fruits. So, like you know, green mango pickles, for for example. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, pickling is 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 an expansive practice. You know, just where you know, based on what people had a lot of. And I noticed there was a question about for, about pickling lettuce. I, I don't know. I mean, there was, a, I, I did read an article about like um, um, Jews from Ukraine make, making lettuce kvass, which is like a, a, a liquid infusion of lettuce fermented. Mm -hmm. um, and I've played around with that. I would say in terms of pickling lettuce itself, probably the the varieties that are firmer, like a romaine or something like that, would have more substance to them. And um, um, you know, thinner leaves of lettuce would just sort of collapse uh, uh, in the course of being pickled. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking that they're so small. I have tried kvass. I have. I think it's a um, it's an interesting taste. It's it's not one that I have grown affection for I love kvass I write about how to make kvass in my books but you know kvass is like fermented dry rye bread but it's so iconic in 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 Russian culture that like anything sa any sour drink is called kvass like kombucha mm -hmm. which was very popular in Russia a hundred years ago one of the names for it was tea kvass and uh, beetroot kvass has become uh, uh, quite popular um, that I enjoy. I like beets, and but but I was in Belarus and I tried their local kvass, and they're very um, territorial. They're they're very proud of kvass wherever you go, <laughs> and it it it's it's a it's a taste you have to grow used to. I find. <laughs> um, and I'm, well, I'm, a lot a lot of these flavors are acquired tastes, yeah, and. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the first time I tasted kvass, and I made it from a written description, but it was like, I mean, I'd never had kvass in my life, and, and it was like going home. It just was like, oh my God, I can't believe how delicious this is. I can't believe I've never had this before. It's incredible. It, it's, it's a lot of fun, and it also is really, really healthy for you. That's, that's how it was described to me a decade ago. Um, and uh, I'm seeing pickled shark came up. Um, there's there's really a, a lot, um, but people seem in particular uh, talking about pickles in barrels, and um, there's still we're lucky we still have um, some pickle guys on the Lower East Side, and I I tend to agree. There's nothing like going there and having a vast array of pickled uh, vegetables and fruits and getting them straight from the barrels. There's something very very fun and delicious about it. Yeah. But, you know, you, I mean, it's the same concept, whether you do it in a jar this size or a jar this size or a ceramic crock or a wooden barrel or like most of the barrel ones these days are in plastic barrels. Um, but, you know, I mean, the process, the process is the same. And generally fermenting vegetables is very easy to scale up. Yeah. 
Well, and, and that leads us, why don't you start your demo and um, take us through the best steps for uh, pickling cucumbers and, and, and give us some tips to keep them crisp. Okay, great. And and I mean, you you did ask about pickle about about um um bloating of pickles, and you know basically you one of the reasons why you generally want to use small pickling cucumbers is to avoid that. If you use larger pickles, um um you know often carbon dioxide from the fermentation will just get stuck inside, and that's what the bloating is. So if you use um um you know small pickling style. Um, um, cucumbers, the, those are the ones that generally work the best. Now, I have them sitting in an, I, well, when I started uh, 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 this, they were in an ice water bath. Now they're just in a water bath. So, you know, that, that, that's one thing that really helps crisp them, crisp them up is like, get them really cold before you start. So I, I always put them in an ice water bath. The other thing that I've done with almost all the cucumbers is I've scraped off the residue of the blossom. So I saved one where I have it. So, you know, every, every cucumber has a stem end. And if the stem is broken off, that just appears um, um, like a little uh, a white fleshy bit. And then the other side where the blossom was, there's generally a little bit of a brown residue. Uh, uh, which maybe you can see. And so, you know, I'll just take each pickle and just like scrape away with the edge of a paring knife, or you can even use your fingernail for that. Just scrape away any residue of the blossom because, you know, there, there's these enzymes that break down the pectins and they are just found um, in greatest concentration in any residue of the blossom. So you want to scrape away um, um, any residue of, of the blossom. You have your, your cucumbers in an in a, um, ice water um, solution. You want to use pickling variety cucumbers, generally small ones that are firm. If they're not firm, that means there's already a pocket inside of them, and that's going to fill with carbon dioxide, and that's going to be what, what bloats. Um, you know, then meanwhile, you, you have your vessel prepared, and in this case, I'm, I'm just going to use, a, th this is a, a half a gallon size, size mason jar. Um, now, I always add grape leaves. And grape leaves are another way to help keep the, 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 the cucumbers crunchy. So I'll just take a handful of, of grape leaves and put them in here. You know, if you don't know where to get grape leaves, you know, any of the vendors at a farmer's market, if you get to know them, could potentially bring you grape leaves because, you know, most cleared fields will have some trees on the edge that have wild grapevines growing up them. Um, you know, you can potentially use other for it's about the tannins. Um, so people sometimes use sour cherry leaves, horseradish leaves, um, uh, other kinds of leaves. I've heard of people using oak leaves. I've heard of people taking a tea bag and putting that in. So, you know, there are other ways that you can get some tannins in there, which will help to slow down these enzymes um, if you don't have access to grape leaves. Then I take my, my garlic. I always, I always use garlic. Um, and... You know, one thing is that you don't have to peel the garlic. What I do is I take whole heads of garlic and I just cut them in half. And then the flavor of the garlic will just infuse into my brine solution. So I'm gonna just go put my, my four halves of, 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 of garlic in there. Um, and then dill, ideally I, I would use flowering heads of dill, um, but my dill is just not, not um, uh, uh, that fully developed yet. So um, I'm just going to use um, um, dill seeds. Um, and, um, you know, this is not rocket science. You don't have to worry about um, um, extreme precision. You know, if you love the flavor of dill or the flavor of garlic, add more. If you want less, add less. Not everybody uses um, 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 dill. I mean, you know, the, the pickles I grew up with were with dill. I was teaching in Poland a few years ago and, a, and my students got into a bit of a heated argument. And some of them like said, oh, dill's gross in a pickle. You need to use all spice as a seasoning in a pickle. Um, so, you know, people have different ideas about the appropriate seasoning of, 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 of the pickle. Um, then I just pack my cucumbers in and then I'll pour a brine over it. Um, so I'm gonna, as I'm packing the cucumbers in, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the brine. So, you know, basically you wanna, um, 
use as little brine as possible to cover the vegetables. Um, um, you know, the more brine you use, the, the more you're going to be diluting the flavor of the vegetables. So, um, you know, generally, whatever the size of your vessel, you want to figure that it'll be at least half full of vegetables and less than half of it will be brine. So, um, you know, I, since this is a two quart um, um, uh, uh, vessel, I have prepared one quart of, uh, of, of uh, water to, to make into brine. Um, and um, I actually measured out a liter rather than a quart because the brine strength that I typically like to use is a 5% brine and it's all just much easier in the metric system. So, um, uh, you know, a, a liter weighs a kilogram. And so a 5% uh, brine needs 50 grams of salt in a liter. To make five percent, if you tried to figure that out in the imperial um, uh, 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 system, you'd have like you know just crazy fractions. Um, so uh, I've never actually done a percentage. I've always just had like I, I add two tablespoons or you know sort of a trial and error. Is that one of the? I mean problems? that's 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 that that that's totally fine. Okay. That, that's totally fine too. And, and you can always like, you know, even if you measure it, you always want to taste it the next day yeah. after the salt has had a chance to absorb into the vegetables so that, um, uh, uh, you know, you, you make sure it's to your liking. So, okay, now I've packed all of the, all of the cucumbers in uh, uh, tightly. There's one cucumber that didn't fit my estimation. My estimating was pretty good. Um, um, so I, so I pour them all in there and now I have, um, my liter of water. Then this is 50 grams of salt, which is roughly three tablespoons, but you know, salts, different salts have different densities. Um, uh, you know, a, 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 a tablespoon of big salt, a bit, coarse salts will be a little different than a tablespoon of fine salt. So, you know, weight is a more um, precise way, but as I said, it just doesn't necessarily require precision. Um, and then I just mix it. Um, you know, and some, some people really emphasize um, uh, um, boiling the water first and, and, and mixing salt into boiled water. Um, you know, certainly if you're, you know, working with water out of a municipal tap, boiling would be great to um, um, get most of the chlorine to evaporate. You know, I have nice spring water, so I'm not really worrying about that. And, you know, you just have to basically do like 30, 30 seconds of stirring, and then you can get the, the, the salt to dissolve in, uh, you know, in your cold water. So there's a few good questions related to this. Um, okay. As far as um, salt, uh, yeah, this was Carol. Carol just said, does iodized salt matter? That was on my brain too. Um, yeah. What happens about with iodized salt? Yeah, I mean, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the literature would really suggest that you stay away from iodized salt. I use unrefined sea salts then they, they have traces of iodine. And because I've just done so many demonstrations of this stuff with whatever people hand me, I've learned that there's not enough iodine in iodized salt to um, inhibit the fermentation in any way. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, kosher salt works great. Um, but, but I mean, the, the, the biggest thing I would say is you know, don't delay trying this to have to get some specific kind of salt. Whatever kind of salt you have in your kitchen is going to work fine. Um, um, uh, you know, whether it's unrefined sea salts, whether it's kosher salt, whether it's iodized table salt, um, um, you know, you don't have to be precious about it. You can work with what, with what you've got. And, and another, there's a few interesting questions too. Someone asked if they can slice the pickles, um, what happens? Will they be less crisp? Yeah, I mean, I have found that I get the, the, the crispiest, crunchiest pickles if I use small pickling cucumbers and leave them whole. 
you know, if what I have to work on is big slicing cucumbers, then I'll definitely cut them into pieces and 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 ferment either you know slices or 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 spears or or or, or chunks of them. Um, um, and um, you know, and I generally wouldn't ferment them as long because they have more of a tendency to 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 get soft. Right. I I had always understood that the. Um... The fermentation was actually the um, the bacteria eating through or or getting through the the skin of the pickle. Is that true, or is that kind of a focus? well? I mean, the fermentation is the um, you know is the bacteria consuming carbohydrates from the cucumber and metabolizing them into acids. But, you know, it'll penetrate, you know, through the skin, you know, once it's submerged, it'll penetrate very quickly through, through the skins. One thing you want to be really aware of is um, um, vegetables floating at the top. So, um, you know, if I do this in a big vessel, like a, like a, a, a cylindrical ceramic crock, I might take a plate that fits inside and just have a plate on the, on the top, weighting everything down. If you're doing it in a jar, these days you can buy like little glass discs like this, or, you know, somebody gave me a little homemade ceramic disc, another little homemade ceramic disc, but just like a little, a little weight just to make sure the vegetables um, um, stay under the brine um, um, can really help. And, um, you know, and then if you put a lid on the jar, just be aware that it needs to off gas. So you're gonna need to, you know, after a day or two, just loosen that lid to let the carbon dioxide that's formed uh, uh, out, or you can just leave it loose. Now, you know, the million dollar question is how long do I ferment it and how, and how will I know when it's ready? And, um, you know, we have people in so many different um, places and climates. And, you know, if you are, you know, if you are where, you know, my Ashkenazi uh, um, um, ancestors were, if you're in, you know, if you're in Russia, you're in Poland, when cucumbers are ripe in the summertime, it's just not that hot. And you're probably fermenting them for several weeks. On the other hand, I live in Tennessee. And if I left these on the counter at ambient temperature for three weeks to ferment, like I would have baby food at the end of that. You know, I would just have like mushy, mushy, mushy uh, um, um, pickles. So, you know, what I'll typically do is ferment them um, like four or five days on the counter until the color like begins to change. So you can see the color of a fresh cucumber contrasted against the color of, um, of, of one that's already been pickled. Um, and um, so I just wait for the color to change, which usually be like three, four days. And then once the color changes, I'll just bury them in the back of the refrigerator and leave them for like, you know, three more weeks in the refrigerator before I eat them. Because the lactic acid bacteria will continue to function at um, refrigerator temperatures. They'll be slowed down by the lower temperature, but they'll continue to function. Um, um, you know, if you had like a 60 degree space, like, you know, you could just ferment this for, you know, many, many weeks and, and, and it would just become more and more delicious. A, a good question is, can you reuse the brine? Okay, this is a great question. And I would say up until about seven years ago, I would have told people absolutely not. Like you wanna remake a brine every single time you make pickles. And, um, you know, certainly you wouldn't wanna reuse a brine where the cucumbers started to get soft already or you had any other kind of a problem with them, but you can reuse brine and um, you know, when I went to China in search of the historical roots of sauerkraut, because all of the historical literature says that the idea of fermenting vegetable uh, under a brine really came from China and that the nomadic people of Central Asia sort of spread the, the, the method um, westward uh, uh, into Europe. Um, but in China, I learned um, um, a, a method called Pao Tsai. And th this brine is, 
So, I mean, I, I started these when I got back from that trip at the beginning of 2017. And um, um, so for more than six years, I've been working with this brine. Now, over time, I have to add more salt. You can't just, because like, you know, that 5% brine, once it absorbs into the cucumbers, you're going to end up with a, an average saltiness of under two and a half percent. Um, and so, you know, you, you'll need to add more salt if you want to reuse a brine. You probably want to add more garlic, more dill, because those flavors will migrate out with, with, the, with the cucumbers. And so with my Pao Tsai brine, I use very different kinds of seasoning profile. I use Sichuan peppercorns and um, star anise and licorice um, and ginger. But, you know, I replenish the spices. I replenish the salt over time. Um, but after the first batch of pickles in here, each subsequent batch is much faster because there's a greater concentration of the lactic bacteria. Hmm. Oh, that's that's fascinating because I had always heard you you need to, to you know you couldn't reuse the blur brine. So that is a new. Well, I think that there are trade offs. I mean, I think that you know particularly with cucumber pickles, like there is this issue of the enzymes, and if you you know if you if, if, if you put in a brine that's already rich in those enzymes, you might end up with your cucumbers getting softer, faster. I don't typically reuse the brine on my pickles, but you know, now I can't be hard and fast saying you would never use, reuse brine because I've been working with these pickles where I do reuse the brine. Um, so, you know, it definitely, it definitely can be done and, and you can experiment with it. So I'm looking, there's some, we, you were speaking about the um, tannins and I, I put in the chat, I always use um, dried bay leaves just because they're so simple to come by. Um, but someone asked about using rye bread and uh, I hadn't yeah, heard of that. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, you know, people, people whose families are from Romania. Um, uh, always talk about putting a piece of rye bread on the top. I, I corresponded for a while with this guy who was in his 70s. He lived around DC and he was spending his retirement like trying to create um, um, controlled experiments of all of his mother's folklore about pickling and cooking. And so, uh, you know, he, from his experiment, he decided that, that you know, there was no, um, uh, 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 discernible difference between the pickles made with a piece of rye bread on top and pe and and the ones made without a piece of rye bread uh, on top but but definitely it's it's a way that people make pickles and you know nothing that's a way that has worked for people is wrong to do it might not be sure. necessary to do but um uh it you know it adds another dimension to them i um, i saw a really important question that i want to address because i think that this is the this is like the, the the biggest anxiety that people have and the question was um uh uh it was about safety you know how do you know you're not um you know, endangering yourself or the other people who are going to um, uh, 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 eat them. And, you know, fermenting vegetables is as safe as food gets. Vegetables get safer than they are raw when you ferment them. Um, you know, we, we read every year about, you, you know, people getting sick from outbreaks on, you know, this year it was red onions, one year it was lettuce, one year it was tomatoes, you know, clearly there's the possibility that vegetables can be exposed to bacteria that can make us sick. And usually the story is runoff from a field with animals uphill washes over a field with vegetables. And so, you know, that, 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 that can happen. But if you took those and fermented them, the lactic acid bacteria that would build up and produce lactic acid, that rising level of acidity would destroy the pathogenic bacteria. So, you know, just try not to worry about safety. The things that can go wrong are all aesthetic things. Like if, you're, if your cucumbers turn, turn out to be mushy, you might spit it out, but it's not going to hurt you. Um, um, and so, you know, just pickling is extremely safe. Like the organisms that can make us sick, 
cannot survive in a highly acidic environment. And, you know, somebody asked about using litmus paper. I mean, sure, you can use litmus paper or you can buy an electronic um, um, uh, um, pH meter, but, you know, it's really unnecessary for home fermentation. You know, you can smell and you can taste the acidity. You know, commercial producers basically have to test the pH of each batch. And, you know, once the, the, the magic number in the U.S. is 4.6, once you reach a, a pH of 4.6, um, you know, it is understood that, you know, none of the pathogens can survive. So someone wants to know how many days of fermentation till those um, dangerous organisms are killed? I mean, it depends on the temperature. You know, I mean, fewer days in a warmer environment, but you'll have better pickles if you do it in a cooler environment and, and let it go right. a few more days. But, you know, when I was working on the art of fermentation, um, you know, I, I got a bunch of like litmus papers and there's people who sell little like lactobacillus starter cultures and they're big, you know, which is I to me a totally exploitative product because like all plants growing out of soil on planet Earth have lactic acid bacteria. You don't need to add the bacteria. They're already always there. Um, but these people who were selling um, 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 uh, a powdered starter for fermenting vegetables, you know, were trying to convince me that like it makes the process safer. So I was like, okay, let's see how much faster can we reach the the the, the sort of safe number. And um, you know, it was like one day faster if I added powder bacteria than if I than than if I didn't in my like limited controlled experiment. Um, but what I would also say to the person worrying about that is like. I hope you're not worrying about eating raw vegetables just because there is this tiny theoretical possibility that occasionally people get sick. I mean, you know, vegetables in general are extremely safe and, you know, each day you pickle them where the pH gets lower, they get even safer. I wanted to just um, put in one, uh, one, not a warning, just advice. Um, if you don't burp, or that's what I always call it. When if you don't unscrew the jar and let some of the gases out, if you keep the jar closed for too long, what you may get is um, a buildup of the gas. And I've had the worst I've had is just coming back and seeing some of the liquid, you know, coming out of the jar. I've heard sometimes it can be a little more um, explosive, but not really explosive. It just you, you'll get you'll get some some liquid kind of popping out of the jar. So you do need to kind of monitor that gas if you if you keep it shut tight. And the you know the other thing is that you know as this as the fermentation begins and it starts forming carbon dioxide it'll lift everything up. So if your jar if your jar is like almost full as this one is then you should expect a little bit of leakage and that's not a big deal, but you know, don't put it on top of your grandparents' wedding photos or your passport or other you know important papers. Um, yeah. You know, put it on the kitchen counter. Maybe put it on a plate, um, uh, and then it's not a big deal if it does um, spill over a tiny bit. Someone was asking about the mold that can grow. Is that okay? Um, is it safe to consume? Yeah, so I mean, it's very rare that mold grows. Usually what grows is a, a phenomenon called calm yeast. And it's this little sort of, you know, white layer on the top, totally normal, totally harmless. Um, you know, if you, if you observe it forming, definitely try to remove it as best you can, but it'll dissipate into the brine and you probably won't be able to remove all of it and, and don't worry about it. It's, it's totally safe. If on the other hand, you have like a cucumber sticking out of the brine and it's just in the air, especially in an open vessel or a vessel with a lot of air space, then, I mean, that could start to grow a mold on it. And the way I would approach that, if it's just like one single cucumber sticking out like an iceberg, is I would just discard that cucumber. I just pull that cucumber out and, 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 and discard it. Um, but, but generally what, what can grow on the surface where there's oxygen is, uh, is, is, is calm yeast and, um, you know, it's, it's almost inevitable. 
um, especially because you know cucumbers are ripe in the summer and the temperatures are high or relatively high in the summer wherever you are. Um, and so, um, um, you know, in warm environments, calm yeast is very, very uh, uh, common. You know, different things that, I mean, there definitely are physical systems for fermentation that um, are designed and engineered in ways that um, protect the surface from oxygen. So, you know, that's one way to completely uh, uh, avoid that, that issue. Um, you know, what I saw, um, um, you know, the woman who taught me how to make pao tsai in China, she would pour a little bit of liquor on. If she had, um, uh, if she had calm yeast, she would pour some um, uh, baiju, which is a Chinese style of liquor. And, and basically the, 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 the liquor floats to the top the alcohol kills that that yeasty layer at the top, and then it evaporates. Um, so I thought that that was a very interesting uh, approach. I, I've done that a little bit, but you know, I, I mean, at this point, it just doesn't put me off. Like I, I just remove it, and that's it's just not a big deal for me. Try not to be too freaked out if you get a little bit of um, uh, um, you know funky surface growth. It's generally just this harmless calm yeast. When I have seen molds, they've been uh, uh, white, hairy molds uh, will succeed the calm yeast sometimes. Um, you know, those are generally regarded as harmless. Um, um, and, and, you know, some people just, uh, you know, remove a top layer and, and, and eat what's below. And some people um, are too worried about that and throw the whole thing away. Um, you know, whatever, whichever of those suits you. I see um, there's two questions I want to make sure we we get to before and we're going to go I think a little bit over if people have so many questions um one is and I've heard this before people are worried um they want to know do you have to sterilize the jars and I want to say I never do um I just wash my jars really uh well before I, I start and I do reuse jars from supermarkets on a regular basis me too me too. And, and, you know, honestly, my perspective about like, you know, sterilizing things is that's a fantasy that we've been sold. And there's all kinds of chemicals you could buy that would sterilize the thing. And then you'd rinse it with your water that's not sterile. And you'd put it in your drying rack that's not sterile. And your hands that aren't sterile would be handling it. And your air in your apartment isn't sterile. So, you know, it's just like the, the, the point is that there's a critical mass of these bacteria that we want on the vegetables and the you know random assortment of um um you know ambient bacteria that are going to end up being you know on the jar or on your hands as you're handling it are completely insignificant um so you know cleanliness is important clean tools clean hands um clean vessel but soap and water is really perfectly adequate I mean, what I do find is when you're reusing jars, sometimes the top will start to, um, you know, you'll you'll see it being eaten away. I think by the salt content, then then I might throw it away, and and you can often get reu, you know, you can get replacements. This is the golden age of mason jar lids. You can just buy, like this is a wooden lid um, with a plastic insert just to sort of make it a little bit more airtight. This works really great. You can get plastic lids. Um, yeah, I mean, the metal, the metal part of the lid can certainly corrode both right. from the salt and from the acidity. But beyond that, I've never, I've never worried a lot. Now, I do think sometimes this might be people confusing um, the canning process where I know people are very careful about, mm. about um, yeah, I mean, can, this isn't that. Canning is almost the diametrical opposite of fermentation because in canning, you're trying to sort of sterilize everything in, in, in a jar. Um, um, in fermentation, what you're trying to do is, you know, cultivate the growth of specific kinds of bacteria that will, you know, enhance the flavor and um, um, preserve the food and maintain the safety of it. Right. And another question a few people have asked, and I've heard this too, people who have, uh, who are on low salt or salt-free diets want to know, um, what do they do? I mean, is there ways to, I know I've, I've been able to cut the salt a lot you know, I, there has to be salt to create, I think, this, um, this pig, the fermentation, oh. or is, or does there? 
Well, I mean, there certainly are traditions of fermenting vegetables that don't use any salt. They don't taste very good. They don't have a very good texture. I mean, salt also helps to slow down these enzymes that will make the vegetables uh, um, get soft and mushy. I've actually had, I, I've had quite a bit of salt-free sauerkraut. So, you know, cabbages take much longer to get soft and mushy. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's a little bit more realistic to do an extremely low salt or no salt sauerkraut than cucumber pickle, because, um, you, you know, cucumbers just have such a propensity to get soft and mushy and the and the salt is really um, um, important for for preventing that. So, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I do, you know, like like this um, uh, daikon uh, uh, kraut that I have, I mean, this has, you know, less than 1% salt, you know, compared to this, I made a 5% salt brine, which is going to equilibrate into about two to two and a half percent, but this has half as much salt as that. Um, um, and it's maintained a great texture for for uh, a, a long period of time. And, and can people find these um, percentages in your book, Wild Fermentation? Yeah, sure. Well, and actually, I'm I'm going to post right now. My um I'm on my on my website is uh, um my, uh, a recipe for sour pickles, and you'll also find that in Wild Fermentation. And um, uh, and also in the art of fermentation, somebody asked where they could find my pao tsai recipe. That's in my um, uh, uh, latest book, Fermentation Journeys. Um, uh, um, and also, um, you know, anyone who's interested in sort of the, the the things I learned about in China, I made a series of videos that are available for free on YouTube. They're called People's Republic of Fermentation. Um, and, and one of them is devoted to pao tsai, and then each one is devoted to a different fermentation process that I was able to learn about. So uh, we have a lot of, I mean, I think we could just be talking for a very long time, and maybe we should talk again. Um, one, I'll ask um, this one, do you ferment beets the same way as you do um, the cucumbers, or how, how do you ferment beets? Well, I mean, Usually the way I'm fermenting beets is I, I, I love to make beetroot kvass. Actually, it's so funny because um, I'm actually for dinner, I'm making a cold borscht that's in the refrigerator. Um, but um, um, uh, uh, beet kvass is, so, so beet kvass is like a liquid infusion of beets that's fermented. Um, so that's, you know, that's because I love this so much. Um, you know, that's typically how I, how I, 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 how I've been fermenting beets, but I mean, certainly I've played around with lots of other styles of, of fermenting beets. I mean, you know, you can just like grate beets and salt them sauerkraut style. You could put whole beets into a brine, like we're talking about with, um, with, um, uh, uh sour pickles, um, and, and by the way, you can mix vegetables together. I mean, there's exactly the same method that I'm using for, for cucumbers. I use for string beans. I use for whole pickled okra. Um, and sometimes, particularly at the end of the gardening season, um, you know, when the frost is about to come, I might pick like uh, uh, sweet peppers, um, um, the remaining string beans, you know, even some cucumbers in with that, maybe tiny little zucchinis and like mix a bunch of different vegetables and put them under a brine and pickle them together. So it doesn't have to just be cucumbers. I mean, I referenced the pickled green tomatoes that my grandfather loved. I mean, you would basically do exactly the same thing, except instead of cucumbers, you would put in um, um, green tomatoes. And you all, you know, you can, ferm I mean, there's ways of fermenting red tomatoes, but they'll never hold their form. So usually that would be like making a salsa and then fermenting it for a day or two to make it, you know, sour and probiotic. Um, but if you want them to hold their form, then you really need either green tomatoes or in uh, a Russian cookbook, sometimes you'll find recipes for cherry tomatoes where the tomatoes are just beginning to blush red and they'll still hold their uh, uh, shape. It, it, we're really approaching a season where the farmer's market is full of uh, vegetables we can pickle uh, or if you have if you're lucky enough to have a garden. Um, so. It's a, it's a perfect time to be talking. Um, 
I do want to ask, um, a couple of people have asked about um, different uh, alternatives to um, just looking. They, they, they are, there's a lot about salt, but we just covered that. Um, there, there, was a, there was something I was surprised by. Um, um, I do see a question. The, the last question that's there is, would the veggies need to be like size if you ferment them together? And not, not necessarily. I mean, the larger vegetables might take a little bit longer for the brine and the salt to reach the center, but only marginally so. So, I, you know, I, I've, I've mixed things of different sizes. And by the way, for anyone who doesn't know, in southeastern Europe, I saw this in Croatia, but throughout the lands, that, like the Balkan states that used to be Yugoslavia, the people typically don't shred cabbage to make sauerkraut. Typically, they ferment whole heads of cabbage. And then if they want to make sauerkraut, they'll slice them after the fermentation. But the amazing thing that people do with that is they peel off the entire um, um, uh, uh, leaves of cabbage and then use those fermented leaves of cabbage for sarma and other kinds of you know stuffed cabbage delicacies. Which reminds me that these grape leaves at the bottom, you don't have to throw these out at the end. You know, make dolmas. What I do is all season the little batches of, of, of um, uh, 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 pickles that I make. I save all the grape leaves and the garlic in a jar under brine in the fridge. And then at the end of the season, I'll make dolmas with, um, uh, you know, all of those um, fermented grape leaves. And, and you know, in terms of the, the garlic, I mean, I'll use that for anything. That, I'm, I'm getting very hungry. I confess. Um, the, 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 um, what the, the uh, additive I was wondering about, people are asking about calcium chloride, and I'm not familiar with it. But can that keep the pickles crisp? And then I have one last question. Well, I've never heard of people doing calcium chloride for raw um, fermented pickles. Um, you know, I've mostly seen that in recipes for like, vinegar pickles. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have no experience with it. So I don't know that, you know, that it couldn't be done, but I have no experience with it. Okay. And then the way that works is like it's a chemical reaction that makes the um, uh, uh, flesh of the cucumber like firmer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it myself. Um, why don't we end by your giving a little background. A few people have asked us, um, what got you started pickling and, um, and, what, and, and, and what kind of experiments did you begin with? And uh, maybe you can even tell us if you have a favorite vegetable or fruit to pickle. But really, what got you started? Let, let's end with a little more about you. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, as I said, like, as a, as, as a kid, I loved pickles, and I had a little reputation in my family for if the pickles were all gone from the fridge, probably I was the one who ate them. Um, and um, uh, so I've always been drawn to the flavor of pickles. Mm -hmm. um, 30 years ago, I moved from New York to rural Tennessee. Um, you know, I basically became part of, uh, of a commune and um, I jumped right into gardening and cooking for people. And the first season that I was gardening, um, you know, we had this like beautiful row of cabbages and I was like, oh my God, you know, I was such a, I was such a naive city kid that I'd never really thought about the idea that in a garden, all of the cabbages would be ready at the same time. Um, so, you know, when we had this beautiful row of cabbage, I was like, oh my God, what are we gonna do with all these cabbages? And then I was like, I think sauerkraut has something to do with, ferment, with, with, with preserving cabbage. And I know I love sauerkraut. Um, and so, you know, I looked in the joy of cooking. I learned how to make sauerkraut from the joy of cooking. And, um, uh, and then I just started playing around like, oh, okay, that was deceptively simple. That was, you know, really delicious. You know, well, what happens if I use turnip instead of cabbage? What happens if I mix a few different vegetables together? Um, oh, I wonder how I can make the kind of, you know, cucumber pickles that I grew up with. And, you know, I just started, you know, looking through cookbooks, trying things, experimenting, but, you know, it was sort of based on this sort of like lifelong love of pickles and, and, and wanting to like, 
you know, capture these flavors. And, you know, I mean, for me, I, I, I mean, nothing is better than a cucumber pickle. I mean, you know, it continues to be a real favorite thing of mine. But I, what I will say about fermentation traditions is that, you know, people, I mean, in every part of the world, people ferment what is abundant. You know, people are not fermenting, you know, sort of precious, hard to find things. They're fermenting the things that are in great abundance. So I have this farmer friend who plants daikon radishes on acres of land as a cover crop. And then he just plows them back in, but he lets me come with a pickup truck every year and I can fill up a pickup truck with, wow. with daikon radishes and not even make a dent. So, you know, so I've been fermenting daikon radishes because they are abundant in my life. Um, um, and, and, and they're delicious. I mean, you know, if, if they weren't delicious, I, I wouldn't ferment them just because they were abundant, but, but they're, they're really very delicious as well. I also want to just point out in case like, um, people haven't noticed my shirt has pickle, <laughs> a pickle motif. Um, pickle, pickle where is, uh, <laughs> is, is a coming attraction. <laughs> pickle where and pickle when. <laughs> And I hope maybe you'll be uh, traveling around. I know you 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 do turn up in different states um, at pickle festivals, and you run you run some seminars. Um, I yeah, yeah, I mean, I've really that you know, on your I'm, website. I'm really like a full time fermentation educator, and I you know I I host things here where I am. I I, I do online events like like the one we're in the middle of right now. Um, I travel different. I was actually in the Hudson Valley a few weeks ago. There was a fermentation festival in uh, New Paltz, New York. Um, uh, um, you know, so I, I I I travel lots of different places and teach about fermentation. And I'm sure we can follow some of your travels on your website, correct? Exactly. Wildfermentation.com is, is my website. And you can find out about my books and uh, the classes that I teach. And I just post, you know, my whole schedule. Like this event has been up there. Um, and you can see what I have coming up in, in, in the next few months. So I, I want to thank everyone. And I want to, and I know Ariel is coming back to, uh, to close us out, but it's been incredible. And um, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation, Sander. All right. Um, 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 oh, okay. I see, I see uh, someone who's watching is a student at um, uh, Middle Tennessee State University, which is uh, 25 miles from where I live, has a fermentation sciences program. And, um, you know, fer fermentation is a huge industry. And um, um, uh, there are a lot of fermentation programs like that that are cropping up. And, and if I just can put one um, uh, incentive in too, um, some people have put in the chat that they have, they are, they've had connections to the workers circle. Um, why don't you email us at info at circle.org and, and um, We'd love to talk to you and find out about your history. We're approaching our 125th year and uh, we're looking for stories and we, we'd love for you to get involved in our activism today. So um, it was really, it's been really fun to see so many people sharing such incredible stories, pickling and otherwise. And um, I know where I'm going to be this weekend. If any of you are on the Lower East Side, there's a better than average chance you'll find me at the Pickle Guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you all so, so much, um, Anne and Sander. This has been a complete delight. Um, thank you to everyone who's here and for all of your participation and sharing all of your stories and memories. This is, it's such a, it's such a beautiful hour and 15 minutes of a community. So I'm really, I'm really grateful to be here with all of you. Um,